I want to lay the roads now so that generations after generations can use those same roads to get to the moon, get to Mars, go beyond that. The decision to move into Starlink gives the company a market adjacency that's significantly larger in size and has the potential to generate the types of revenues and profits that would be needed for that Mars colony. Firefly is aiming to be the next SpaceX. Most rocket companies do not succeed. Starship is capable of getting a million tons to the surface of Mars and creating a self-sustaining city. In the most remote parts of the U.S., reliable internet is still hard to come by. 42 million Americans still don't have access to broadband. This is a nine and a half acre homestead in Idaho. And when we first got here, we had zero cell service. We tried to put boosters at the top. We tried to put boosters at the bottom. We tried to put boosters anywhere we could. We had no cell service. So we really needed some good, reliable internet. And then Starlink came along. Mike Lorden and his fiance Liz Racer are one of more than 10,000 customers using Starlink, SpaceX's ambitious project to build an interconnected network of thousands of satellites to provide high-speed broadband internet across the globe. They've been using Starlink service for about six months now and are documenting their experience of living in a homestead on YouTube. There are some times when the Starlink does drop out. The dropouts aren't really significant. It seems to be just like short little blips, you know, a couple seconds here and there. The only time that you really, really notice it is if you're like live streaming or if you're using the Wi-Fi calling option. Other than that, you know, if you're just surfing the web or something, it seems to be very fast. So far for what it is, it's a real good connection, you know, considering our circumstances. Starlink is still in beta and currently serves select customers in the northern U.S., Canada, the U.K., Germany, and New Zealand. Experts estimate that there are around 70 million households worldwide that are good candidates for satellite-based consumer broadband and have the capacity to pay. Amid a global pandemic that's kept employees from going to offices and children from schools, the need for universal broadband has become undeniable. If the service expands to its intended global customer base, Starlink could be key to SpaceX's success and Elon Musk's vision for a colony on Mars. I think it's fair to say that the majority of SpaceX's valuation today is tied to the Starlink business model. Generally speaking, the global launch industry is about a $5 billion a year industry. SpaceX, in previous discussions, has talked about a $30 billion a year opportunity in the Starlink business looking about three to five years out. The basis of Starlink's internet service involves three components, a satellite dish, ground stations, and the satellites themselves. The service is meant for customers like Lorden and Racer, who live in a sparsely populated area that's not being served by traditional internet companies. Given the high cost of laying cable or fiber, which can be as much as $20,000 a kilometer, terrestrial service providers tend to focus on urban and suburban areas where there's high density. It simply does not make economic sense to uh, reach out to consumers in low density areas. The only option we really considered was we had a local internet company that wanted to come in. They would have had to erect a tower on the top of our mountain. They maybe could have given us five megs a second, and it would have been about the same monthly price as the Starlink service. We have other friends that are in similar situations as us, and they have, you know, those other satellite internet providers, and a lot of them are data cap. Most of the rates are real high. Starlink customers pay $499 for the hardware needed to connect to the network, and an additional $99 per month for the service. Currently, there are no data usage caps or contracts. So far, SpaceX has launched over 1,000 satellites into orbit, but the company plans to deploy 4,425 satellites by 2024. By the time that SpaceX is done building out its global Starlink satellite system, known as a Constellation, the company will have launched about 12,000 satellites. And although not yet approved by the FCC, SpaceX has requested permission to launch an additional 30,000 satellites, which would bring their total to 42,000. Unlike traditional internet satellites, which are as big as a school bus and orbit at around 36,000 kilometers above Earth's surface, Starlink satellites are much smaller and closer at about 550 kilometers above Earth's surface. But the satellite's closer placement means they can see less of the Earth at any given point in time, which is why SpaceX needs so many. 
On the flip side, SpaceX claims that this closer orbit allows the system to have a lower signal delay, known as latency. Latency is important for things like video streaming and gaming. Lorden says speeds vary according to factors like weather, but on average he's been getting speeds of about 75 megabits per second for downloads and around 12 megabits per second for uploads. In a filing to the FCC, SpaceX said that Starlink services, quote, meeting and exceeding speeds of 100 megabits per second for downloads and 20 megabits per second for uploads. Musk has said that he expects the service will double in speed by the end of the year. To do this, the company is developing a technology known as inter-satellite links. The basic premise is that you have an optical sensor, which is effectively a laser, that points from one satellite and connects to the another optical sensor on another satellite and creates this you know, unseen path from one to the other that's this stable connection, almost like a wire. And if you, you have that stable connection, you can drastically increase the speed because you're now moving signal from one satellite to the other at the speed of light rather than the speed of whatever's on the ground. Another benefit is reducing the amount of infrastructure needed. Given Starlink's current architecture, we estimate that they will need more than 100 ground stations in the U.S. If, however, they move to the laser communications on the satellites, they can greatly reduce the number of ground stations needed, as well as the complexity of the overall system on a global basis. On the consumer side, Lorden says that working with the technology was simple. SpaceX does not currently provide an installation service, so users are on their own for the most part. They ship and deliver a big old box to your door, and inside that box, it's really not that many items. It would be the Starlink dish itself, the router, the power supply, and the little tripod mount to set the dish on. And it's super straightforward. Starlink actually has an app that you can download on the phone, and it walks you through everything. Literally just plug this thing into the wall and put the dish where the app tells you to put the dish. Starlink's dish comes equipped with a built-in heating element, which keeps it free of snow and ice. It's also motorized, allowing the dish to automatically orient itself to stay aligned with the satellites overhead. But making its equipment user-friendly has not come cheap for SpaceX. The biggest challenge that SpaceX is facing with Starlink is also one of the big unknowns about the actual equipment cost itself. People aren't sure exactly how much either SpaceX is paying for or paying to build its antennas. There's been a lot of speculation that it's $1,000 a unit, $2,000 a unit. If they're you know, selling these kits for $4.99 a kit and it costs them $2,000 to make, they're running huge losses to begin with and they have to get a lot of people on board to make up for that in the long term by charging for service. SpaceX has been tremendously successful in their launch business, dominating the industry in just 10 years. However, the launch industry, global launch industry, is not a large enough market to subsidize Elon Musk's dream of building a colony on Mars. The key to Musk's vision for colonizing Mars is Starship. The massive rocket is meant to be fully reusable and capable of launching up to 110 tons of cargo at once. Though SpaceX has not revealed how much it's spent on the Starship program, in the past, Musk has estimated that it would cost the company about $5 billion to complete. That's where Starlink comes in. The decision to move into Starlink gives the company a market adjacency that's significantly larger in size and has the potential to generate the types of revenues and profits that would be needed for that Mars colony. Earlier this year, a SpaceX job posting revealed that the company is planning to build a factory in Austin, Texas to manufacture its Starlink kits. But although Starlink is initially targeting the consumer market, experts say there's a lot of room for the service to expand. The intended markets for Starlink measure in the tens of billions of dollars ranging from consumers to enterprises and mobility applications, including vessels at sea and aircraft in flight. Starlink's initial focus on consumers is a byproduct of the way that the satellites are launched and the coverage that they provide. Currently, Starlink is not able to provide an enterprise-grade service, so the company is leading with consumers that are a little bit more tolerant. In the past, Starlink's been used by emergency responders in Washington, where the satellites are manufactured to set up an internet connection in areas devastated by wildfires. The U.S. Air Force and the Army are also both testing Starlink. There is a huge hunger for investment in satellite internet. The sector could be worth $412 billion by 2040. And it's not just VCs that are investing. Satellite internet is ripe for government subsidies. In Canada, the government of Quebec has invested millions in Telesat. In China, 
satellite maker ComSat received a massive government investment as part of the country's new infrastructure drive. The US too is betting big. Last year, the FCC awarded Starlink nearly $1 billion in subsidies to bring internet to rural areas. And in late March, President Biden said that his administration would spend $100 billion to expand broadband access to Americans as part of his $2 trillion infrastructure plan. SpaceX is also in talks with the UK, where Starlink could earn funding as part of the country's $6.9 billion internet infrastructure program. But one place where Starlink may not be welcome is in Russia where the government is reportedly considering enacting fines for individuals who sign up for the service. Russia is working on its own satellite internet constellation, which it hopes to begin launching in 2024. Starlink's potential is huge, provided that the project can overcome some major hurdles. Satellite broadband as a whole is a industry and a sector that is just littered with warning signs and the corpses of former companies that have tried to go out and do what Starlink is, is doing already. It's a little discussed secret that all of the successful satellite operators today were subsidized either through government subsidies uh, or through the bankruptcy court in the case of companies like Iridium and Orbcom that went bankrupt in the 1990s only to recover and come back for a second act. One of the challenges of building out a new satellite network is all of the capital expenditure needs to go up front before the very first customer can be signed up. And that creates a really tough financial model in terms of generating the revenue to both pay for the existing constellation as well as the follow-on satellites that will be needed to continue the service. SpaceX's leadership about two or three years ago estimated that they thought it would cost upwards of $10 billion to get Starlink running at an operational capacity. That's a probably a pretty fair estimate still today. Starlink is still fairly early on in development, so it's not perfect. SpaceX makes this clear on its website, saying that there may be periods when customers experience no connectivity, but service will improve as the company launches more satellites. However, having thousands of new satellites orbiting the Earth comes with its own set of problems. Initial launch of SpaceX's Starlink satellites in May of 2019 took astronomers by surprise. They didn't realize how bright the satellites would be, especially as they're raising up to final orbit and how many there would be. So if you looked up, you would see this long line of like what looked like slow moving shooting stars all in a perfect line going across the sky. So the people called them Starlink trains. Now that brought up a pretty significant issue, which is that because they were so bright, they were so clustered together, and there was increasingly more and more and more of them covering different parts of the sky. Astronomers started seeing them pop up and, and really ruining different imagery and, and, and causing all sorts of distortion and effects and things like that. This image, taken from a telescope in Chile in November 2019, illustrates the problem. The telescope, meant to see images of distant stars and galaxies, instead captured the light trails of 19 Starlink satellites. While some image processing tools can be used to remove the trails, Walker says it's not 100% effective. But SpaceX has not ignored the problem. The American Astronomical Society, the AAS, uh, and Noir Lab and others contacted SpaceX. And ever since then, they've been so generous with their time. And what was just a passing interest in our concerns became um, about half a dozen people that they have on staff that are dedicated to finding out mitigation solutions. SpaceX originally tried to paint them like this dark material. The problem was they were still too bright, generally, and they also got pretty hot. They instead came up with what are known as sun visors, and it helps keep the reflectivity of the solar panels from creating a lot of light and a lot of brightness. The other thing they did is they changed the orientation of the satellites themselves so that they were more on like this knife's edge. So that instead of the whole panel catching the sunlight and reflecting it down to Earth, it was just only a piece of it. The huge concentration of satellites also worries radio astronomers, who say that the interference from radio frequencies of internet satellites could hinder the ability of their instruments to look for organic and water molecules in space. Then there's the problem of congestion. Since Russia first launched Sputnik in 1957, over 10,600 objects have been sent into outer space. If SpaceX were to launch all the satellites that it's requested, the company would, by itself, be responsible for almost a fourfold increase in the number of spacecraft launched by all of humanity. And with the lifetime of Starlink satellites only being around five years, experts are also worried about space debris. 
An idea known as the Kessler syndrome summarizes just how detrimental having free-floating junk in space can be. The Kessler syndrome can be described as two satellites that collide and they create more debris that will collide with other satellites and this creates orbits that are just unusable. For its part, SpaceX has said that it plans to deorbit satellites that are nearing the end of their life by pushing them back into Earth's atmosphere, where they burn up during re-entry. All of SpaceX's satellites have propulsion systems on board, which theoretically are more than sufficient to deorbit a satellite in, in a very reasonable period of time. However, if the satellite communication is lost, uh, which has happened in certain cases, you, you lose the ability to tell the satellite to deorbit itself. In other cases, the propulsion system itself may have failed. And when you're launching over 4,000 satellites, all it takes is a very small failure rate to create a lot of space debris. Jonathan McDowell, an astronomer at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, has been tracking Starlink's failure rates and says they've improved. For now, dealing with space debris is still largely left up to individual companies. There is no enforceable law that can uh, cause a company to deorbit a satellite that has failed. Uh, generally speaking, the FCC, along with other governmental agencies, have rules out, uh, guidelines to deorbit satellites within 25 years, but there's no enforcement mechanism that could cause a company to spend money to actively deorbit a satellite, at least today. But experts like Walker are pushing for more national and international oversight of satellite makers. The United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs is already looking at ways to mitigate the effects of light and radio pollution coming from satellites. In the U.S., the Biden administration recently announced that it would continue the National Space Council, which will assist the president in setting national space policies. Plans to spin off Starlink into a separate company have been swirling since last year. And earlier this year, Musk confirmed the idea. Elon Musk again making headlines this morning, this time with SpaceX, saying its broadband satellite business will go public eventually. Musk tweeting, quote, once we can predict cash flow reasonably well, Starlink will IPO. But warning that the business will need to pass through a, quote, deep chasm of negative cash flow over the next year or so to actually make that financially viable. Spinning off the part of SpaceX that has the most earning potential may seem counterintuitive. But experts say there could be some benefits. Right now, Starlink is a huge cash use for the SpaceX business. And if it were spun out independently and charging back, uh, paying SpaceX for those launches, it would obviously boost the revenues of the remaining SpaceX business. If SpaceX is still the majority owner of Starlink after it spins off, then the company can still see the revenue stream, still see the benefits of that service, but it's then de-risking the overall space company, if you will, by having it operate as this separate business so that if Starlink does fail or it does go bankrupt or something bad happens to Starlink, then it's not damaging the core SpaceX business as much as it would as if, if it was still in the entire private fold of the company. SpaceX is currently the leader in low Earth orbit satellite internet, but competition is heating up. Amazon has said that it will invest over $10 billion in its satellite internet network known as Project Kuiper. UK satellite maker OneWeb recently launched another 36 satellites into orbit, bringing its total number to 146. The company says it expects to begin limited service by the end of the year, though unlike SpaceX, its service is geared towards enterprise customers. Finally, Canadian satellite company Telesat has said that it will begin commercial services for its satellite internet in the second half of 2023. If Starlink is successful, it may ultimately do more than just fund Musk's vision for a colony on Mars. SpaceX put in these Starlink terms and agreements that there's a, a bylaws in regards to how their service will be treated for people on Mars. And so SpaceX is already looking down that path and seeing, okay, well, we can have Starlink satellites around Earth in orbit, but then we can also put them in uh, orbit around Mars and then just connect the two and, and have you know this expansive, not just a global satellite system, but a multi-planetary satellite system. But for now, Earthlings are glad that Starlink exists, even if it's not yet perfect. When they first reached out to us, they did label their beta tests as the better than nothing beta tests. And for people like me, it's 100% better than nothing. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk thinks that the holy grail to making life multiplanetary 
lies in humanity's ability to make a completely reusable rocket system that can carry a massive amount of equipment, supplies, and people deep into space. That's why SpaceX created Starship. The critical threshold to pass one of the most important great filters for any species is to have, have the, the, the other planet no longer dependent on, on the original planet. Starship is capable of doing that. It's capable of getting a million tons to the surface of Mars and creating a self-sustaining city. And I think we should try to do that as soon as we can. Starship is SpaceX's largest reusable rocket. The company's been testing Starship prototypes for several years, but none so far have reached space, as SpaceX has encountered both technical and regulatory hurdles. Aside from a potential breakthrough for space travel, Starship is in many ways also indispensable for the future of SpaceX. Many analysts and experts have said, if SpaceX you know, succeeds with Starship and, and st therefore with Starlink, that could create and generate SpaceX into a company that's not a $100 billion valuation company, but a trillion dollar valuation company or more. Private sector funding in space-related companies topped $10 billion in 2021, a tenfold increase over the past decade. Traditionally, most of that funding has concentrated on activities closer to Earth, such as building out satellite communications. But there's evidence that this may be changing. Recently, there's been increased focus on lunar, so the moon and beyond. Think moon, Mars, deeper planetary exploration. Lunar and beyond investment was about $1 billion from private investors in 2021, the highest sum we've seen to date. Even before founding SpaceX, Elon Musk had dreamed of reaching Mars, and Starship is the means to that end. The first thing you notice about Starship is that it's monstrous. The vehicle is made up of two stainless steel components. At the bottom stands the first stage super heavy booster. Stacked on top is the second stage Starship spacecraft, which will be able to carry more than 100 metric tons of cargo and crew per launch. Collectively referred to as Starship, the two components loom nearly 400 feet into the air, almost 100 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. To get all of this weight off the ground is no easy task, and will require 33 of SpaceX's Raptor engines for the booster, and another 7 engines for the Starship spacecraft. To get an idea of just how powerful Starship is, it's helpful to compare it to Saturn V, which was the rocket used by NASA to send astronauts to the moon during the Apollo mission. The Saturn V was uh, 7.5 million pounds of thrust, and um, Starship is 17. So it's more than twice the thrust of a Saturn V, which was the largest rocket ever to get to orbit. Musk says SpaceX's next generation rocket is also more economical than Saturn V. The cost efficiency of SpaceX is the best in history, I think, for, for any rocket development. We are talking about a rocket that's uh, tw more than twice the mass and thrust of a Saturn V, and also designed to be fully reusable, which is obviously also much better for from an environmental standpoint, to have a fully reusable rocket for a development cost that is between 5 and 10 percent of Saturn V. The key to lowering costs is reusability. SpaceX sells its smaller Falcon 9 rockets for between 60 and 90 million dollars, but has brought the cost per launch down to under 30 million by landing the booster, the most expensive part of the rocket, and using it multiple times. With Starship, SpaceX hopes to go one step further, reusing both the Starship spacecraft and the booster. The booster is, is going to take off and then fly back to the launch tower and uh, aspirationally land on the arms, which uh, is, does sound insane. If it does come in too fast um, and, um, and shear off the arms, then I guess it will be a farewell to arms. <laughs> the retrieval of the Starship spacecraft seems equally challenging. The idea is for Starship to re-enter Earth's atmosphere on its side its heat shield covered belly protecting the vehicle from the intense temperature. Closer to the ground, Starship's Raptor engines will kick in and flip the vehicle vertically for landing. Starship has yet to fly any missions, but the project has already brought in some major funding for SpaceX. SpaceX has new contract revenue streams through a major NASA deal to use Starship for the agency's Artemis program to deliver astronauts to the moon's surface by the middle of this decade. SpaceX was the sole winner of the nearly $3 billion contract, 
beating out Blue Origin and Dianetics. NASA has begun paying in hundreds of millions of dollars to SpaceX already towards that development contract. The majority of SpaceX's revenue comes from its launch business. The Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy series of rockets have been generating upwards of two to three billion dollars of revenue a year for the company. They've been able to generate a lot of returns through rideshare programs, through delivering cargo and astronauts to the International Space Station for NASA and other international partners, and more recently been delving into flying private astronauts. But SpaceX's golden egg will likely be Starlink, a satellite internet business which is expected to eventually surpass SpaceX's rocket business. Elon Musk has previously estimated that the company's Starlink business could generate revenues of upwards of $30 billion a year. Starlink is a global internet satellite network made up of thousands of satellites known as a constellation. SpaceX has so far launched around 2,000 satellites, but the company has said that around 12,000 satellites would be needed before the constellation is fully operational. Eventually, SpaceX hopes to bump that number up to 42,000 satellites. The service has over 145,000 customers, but startup costs for the project are steep, and SpaceX is currently losing money on Starlink. Musk recently expanded Starlink service to Ukraine at the request of the country's vice prime minister. In early March, Musk tweeted that Starship development may be delayed as SpaceX focuses on aiding Ukraine. Under the current deployment plan for getting the number of Starlink satellites that SpaceX needs in orbit to get the system truly operational and, and global and providing service as broadly as they desire, it's very, very difficult to see how SpaceX will be able to achieve that in a, both a cost-efficient and a timely matter without Starship. Falcon 9 currently can carry roughly 50 to 60 Starlink satellites at a time into low Earth orbit. However, SpaceX executives have said before that the goal with Starship and its current design is to launch 400 Starlink satellites at a time into low Earth orbit. With the fates of Starship and Starlink so closely intertwined, the pressure is on for SpaceX to get Starship off the ground. But the company faces some steep challenges. Right now, of, of any technical problem, uh, I'm spending the most time personally on, on uh, Raptor 2. In November of 2021, Musk sent out a company-wide email to SpaceX employees, warning them that a Raptor engine production crisis created a risk of bankruptcy for the company. Later, Musk seemed to temper his message on Twitter, saying that while bankruptcy was unlikely, it was not impossible. More recently, Musk said that SpaceX is making good progress with regard to Raptor 2 production. We're close to achieving a Raptor 2 every day production rate, so we're sort of seven a week, which is, is tough for a complex engine. Um, and uh, I think by the end of this year, we'll be able to produce a ship and a booster per month. The only remaining issue that we're aware of is melting the chamber. And it's got like on the order of a gigawatt of, of heat, so it's like a, what a nuclear power plant produces. So it really is desperately trying to melt at any point in time. In order to understand this challenge, it helps to know a little bit about rocket engine design. A rocket engine in a simple form, it's simple. You just have a, what is referred to as a thrust chamber, a combustion chamber. You just bring in oxygen and your fuel and you're burning it into that chamber. The challenge is that chamber is running at really, really high pressures and really, really high temperatures. So doing that means that you know, first is I, I need to be higher pressure to push the propellant in, but then this chamber has to be able to handle the temperatures that is, is seen inside. As the oxygen and fuel burn, they eject a high pressure gas from the nozzle, which in turn propels the rocket into the air. While most rocket engines use either kerosene or hydrogen as fuel, SpaceX decided to make its Raptor 2 engines run on methane. SpaceX used uh, methane primarily because it's the perfect balance between hydrogen being an expensive fuel and challenging to operate uh, versus kerosene, which is, yes, it's cheaper, but energy density is lower compared to methane. The key challenges with using methane is that it will run actually hotter than the typical kerosene. So SpaceX have publicly noted that they've developed special alloys to handle the higher temperature of methane. But despite these challenges, methane also has other advantages. One of the components that erode these engines is fuel coking, 
which is worse with rocket propellant kerosene based fuels but it's actually less of a problem with methane coking is essentially the the soot that you see coming out of your car exhaust it's primarily unburnt fuel that is essentially heated at really high temperatures and pressures and that could go into fuel injectors inside the engine it could uh, coke surfaces it influences your efficiency of your engine Another plus that Elon Musk has talked about in the past is the ability to easily create methane on Mars and use it as a fuel for the return trip to Earth. SpaceX has steadily been building up its testing and production facility, known as Starbase, in Boca Chica, Texas since 2015. The move has garnered mixed reactions from locals, some saying that Starbase has helped create jobs and attract tourists, and others claiming the complex has displaced a beachfront community and endangered wildlife. Early tests of Starship have also been a mixed bag. While SpaceX has had a number of successful Starship launches, the company has lost several prototypes during landing attempts. In May 2021, SpaceX successfully completed its first high-altitude test without the Starship rocket being destroyed. Besides technical problems, Starship also faces regulatory challenges. The next major milestone for Starship is the orbital flight test. They've been really trying to get across this major hurdle of getting an environmental assessment completed by the Federal Aviation Administration, which would give them the key launch license to take those tests from just short flights to, to all the way launching into space. The FAA has said it would complete its environmental assessment by March 28th, but that date could be pushed farther if the agency decides that it needs more time to do a deeper review. Musk said that if this were the case, SpaceX would consider launching Starship from its other location in Florida. I guess our worst case scenario is that uh, we would be delayed for, for six, six or six to eight months uh, to build up uh, the, the Cape launch tower and launch from there. SpaceX's $100 billion valuation makes it one of the most valuable private companies in the world. For the last several years, they've been raising billions of dollars annually from a broad range of investors and steadily increasing their valuation. As far as we can tell, most of the funding for Starship's development comes from outside investors who are buying the currently privately traded stock that SpaceX holds in exchange for capital that the company can use to fund that development. SpaceX has previously said that Starship would cost upwards of $5 billion to develop, whereas the Starlink satellite internet program could cost anywhere between five and $10 billion to develop. So investors getting in at this late stage might be less willing to put more money behind the project if they know that they've hit a roadblock. Beyond just benefiting SpaceX, Experts believe that having a rocket like Starship that's able to lug a massive amount of stuff into space will open up opportunities for other companies. When you look at the infrastructure in space today, the International Space Station, other assets, they were required to be assembled piecemeal in space because we were limited in the ability to carry mass to space. If you now can create much larger systems or infrastructure that can be brought whole up to space, it requires less complexity, less on-orbit assembly, and thus is overall more efficient and helps drive creation of a space economy. Musk agrees that Starship would be widely beneficial. One of the rebuttals we'll sometimes hear is like, sure, but what about all the problems on Earth? And uh, I completely agree that the vast majority of resources should be dedicated to solving problems on Earth. Absolutely. Um, I'd say like more than 99% of our resources should be uh, oriented towards solving problems on Earth. It's important to note that NASA's annual budget it is only 0.36% of the federal budget. And in fact, of the national GDP, it's less than a tenth of a percentage point. Given the, this establishing security for life itself and, and having an exciting future and inspiring the, you know, kids um, about, the, about the future, I think it's, it's, it's worth it. Let's go out there and find out what this universe is all about. Three, two, one, zero, ignition. The rocket business is heating up, and one startup has grand ambitions of following SpaceX to orbit. Firefly is aiming to be the next SpaceX, a very transformative space transportation company. 
It aims to be a dominant launch provider for small satellites and payloads up to 1,000 kilograms, below what competitors like SpaceX are going after. Above the medium class, you have Jeff and Elon and the giant rockets and stuff, and they can have that, they can duke it out, and we'll be down there optimally serving the small and medium markets. Its CEO is an industry veteran. He has past experience first at NASA, then at SpaceX, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, more recently after that, Virgin Galactic. But even with past experience, building a rocket company is not for the faint of heart. Most rocket companies do not succeed, right? They just don't. Greater than 90% of the whole vehicle is just rocket fuel. But you're having to push every piece of that rocket right to the edge of braking, but not braking. And they're not cheap. Had about $250 million into this project before we even tried to fly the rocket the first time. Over the last 10 years, there's been $6 billion invested into about 100 small launch vehicles, and that has produced one orbital vehicle. But Tom Markusik and others are chasing a vision where space is more accessible. Henry Ford, he decided to build a car for everyone, the Model T. We're sort of creating the Model T of the 21st century. We have been operating in space for decades, but the market has been really limited. On the one hand, you've got a handful of defense contractors, and on the other hand, you have the government. Until SpaceX came in. SpaceX has ignited a frenzy in aerospace, spawning numerous startups hoping to build the next great space company. One of the main reasons I left SpaceX is I realized there needed to be more SpaceX's in the world. We have seen 1,600 space companies raise $230 billion over the last 10 years. Over $10.3 billion in private capital has been put into space companies in 2021, exceeding the previous record last year of $9.8 billion. SpaceX recently surpassed an estimated $100 billion valuation. And while Musk's company represents one end of the spectrum, numerous upstarts are attracting respectable interest. There's a number of companies which are maybe within a year of trying to reach orbit or even have tried to reach orbit already. And those companies are the next players to really enter the competition. While the rewards are great, the risks are high. Firefly already suffered through a bankruptcy and is still trying to reach orbit. Firefly didn't come into existence with a silver spoon in its mouth. It's had to claw and fight for every penny that it has. And then it lost it and then it came back. It is not a mystery that there is a phoenix painted on that rocket. I got one of those Estes model rockets when I was in fifth grade, and that really kind of set me on the course to where I am right now, believe it or not. It was something very different when I went out and I launched that model rocket out in Ohio and saw the smoke and the sound and everything. It just kind of drew me in. After getting his PhD in advanced space propulsion from Princeton, Tom Merkusik began his career working for the U.S. government, spending five years with both the Air Force and NASA. Right now it takes potentially six or eight months to go to Mars, but the technologies we are working on at NASA could get you there in a matter of weeks. All this cool technology we are developing wasn't ever going to see space until we figured out how to get to space in a more efficient way. And at that time, Elon Musk and some other companies were coming up with this new space idea that we can dramatically lower the cost and increase the frequency of access to space. He then went to work at SpaceX as its first director of test operations in McGregor, Texas. And in the process of building up that facility and testing rocket engines day and night and testing Falcon 1s and ultimately Falcon 9s, I really just became intimately knowledgeable about end-to-end -end what it took to build launch vehicles. Mark Cusick went on to work at Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, where he was VP of Propulsion and helped lead the development of rocket engine systems and new launch vehicles like Launcher 1. Satellites, which had in the past been these giant monolithic pieces of hardware, were shrinking in size and increasing in capabilities. And I really thought there was a divergence between what the up and coming new space companies were doing and what the customers needed for this new class of satellites. Ultimately, decided that if I really wanted to create a transformative space transportation company, I needed to step out on my own and start my own company. And that was the genesis of Firefly. In January of 2014, Markusek founded Firefly Space Systems alongside PJ King and Michael Bloom. We started with the notion that we would build the world's simplest launch vehicle, the most economic launch vehicle we could. But funding fell through, forcing the company to declare bankruptcy in 2017. 
your burn rates are so fast in this business. Uh, you know, our burn rates here now are on the order of $10 million a month. So that was the case with Firefly Space Systems. We ran out of money, we had to shut down. However, Markusek managed to secure new funding later that year, breathing life back into his space ambitions. That company and its assets was effectively resurrected by a investment firm called New Sphere Ventures, which is funded and primarily led by Ukrainian investor Max Polyakolov. It became Firefly Aerospace. Tom Markusek was reinstated as founder, CEO. New Sphere funded Firefly for about $200 million, and that was our whole seed round that got us to the point of having viable technology to go out and fly. This year, Firefly raised an additional $175 million. Historically, some of the great entrepreneurs, the great industrialists, there was a rough road getting going, and they learned from it, and they kept going. The key is they never quit. This new company has a better business plan, a better technology plan, a better funding plan than the other company, without a doubt. To get to space, Firefly has spent the past few years building its Alpha launch vehicle. Alpha is Firefly's two-stage expendable vehicle. It's the world's largest all-carbon fiber composite rocket, and it has uh, patented, world's simplest rocket engines. It can carry up to 1,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, and it's priced at about $15 million per launch. Eventually, with our progressive upgrades, it'll be able to do about 1,500 kilograms. We build everything ourselves so that we can control cost and schedule. About a year of design, about two years of developmental testing, and about one year of qualifying hardware to get to flight. So all in all, about four years for us to get to the launch pad. When it comes to rockets, a launch company is typically expected to invest about $100 million before successfully reaching orbit. We have to build systems that have super high propulsion, super light structures. Everything has to be very, very efficient. And it's hard to test it on the Earth because Earth is not like space. While you're trying to build the hardware, you're also trying to build a team. And, and roughly in the last four years, we've been doubling the size of the team every year to the point that we're up to about 500 people now. Several at Firefly have come from other space companies such as SpaceX, Blue Origin, and NASA. You have to have really smart engineers. Structures engineers, some mechanical engineers, it's materials engineers, it's electrical engineers that do the avionics, it's software engineers and developers, it's reliability analysts, it's trajectory engineers, it's just so many different disciplines that all come together. After you spend all that money and all that time and you have all those people working for your company, you don't really know if the thing's gonna work until you go out and test it. This is the Reaver engine. This is our first stage engine. This engine is essentially what will be installed on the vehicle. Every engine that we will fly goes through what's called an acceptance testing protocol. And what ATP is seeking to do is both tune the engine, so make sure we have the right amount of propellants in the right combination, as well as ensure the workmanship and quality of that engine itself. We are standing on TS2, which is the stand that we use for testing the various rocket stages. So stage one and stage two both get tested right here. That actually is where the fire goes through when we ignite the engine. Everything we do here is meant to simulate the launch conditions so that when we get there, it's game day. Once things are rigorously tested in Texas, and we transport them to the launch sites, do the final integration of the vehicle, put them out on the launch pad, and we just do one final hot fire test where we put the rocket up, we pretend we're going to launch it, we light it, we let it run, and just verify that everything's in perfect order before we actually just do the final thing, which is let it fly. 16% on O2, made it all the way.
We've been working on this for years and years. A lot of money's gone into this and tomorrow's the, the payoff. It's just such an incredible feeling to finally be at this day. Ten foot clear of the town for hydraulic operations. That status is amber. During the first flight, we had a failure where one of the engines simply just turned off in flight, and it turned out it was just a simple electrical connector that, that rattled loose. To go to all that effort and to have it fail feels like a lot of other things that happened in this company. To go all that effort and then run out of money, you have to shut down, lay everybody off, boot back up. It's one of those things that's, that's deeply troubling, but in the back of your mind, you have the conviction that ultimately you'll be successful. A lot of companies over the year have attempted the same thing and failed to do so on their first tries, but have been ultimately successful. This is a business that is quite unforgiving. And even though we had an engine out, we got a lot of flight time, so we got a lot of aerodynamics data, we got a lot of uh, control data, we got a lot of data about how the, how the rocket moves, even up through supersonic speed, so that data is gold. The company isn't skipping a beat, aiming to conduct its next flight in early 2022. The plan is to have the vehicle behind us fully ready to go by the end of the year and launch as soon as we can in, in the beginning of the new year. Now it's about refinement. In every flight, you make it easier and easier and easier. We have people looking as far out as like flight six and flight seven. Firefly's Alpha rocket will compete in the small to medium launch market. For $15 million, it will take payloads such as small satellites to low Earth orbit. In comparison to competitors, Rocket Lab's smaller Electron costs $7 million per launch, Astra's as cheap as $2.5 million, and ABL's RS-1 costs $12 million per launch. To provide context, SpaceX Falcon 9 costs about $62 million per launch. The company is also developing a higher capacity rocket, which it says will be capable of carrying up to 8,000 kilograms. We've got some great strategic partnerships potentially set up with that that will allow us to start flying hardware in as little as a couple of years. Down the road, Firefly has additional plans for a winged reusable rocket. These are long-term development projects that they really won't be able to spend much time on and, and really won't be able to see the light of day until their core central businesses are up and running first. The company is positioning itself as an end-to-end -end space transportation company. We are not a rocket company. A rocket is an important part of it, but it's really one third of our whole space transportation architecture. The Blue Ghost is our lunar lander solution that fulfills the NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Services mission. We want our first proposal. It's originally at $93 million. It's taking 10 payloads, just under 100 kilograms worth of NASA experiments. NASA's Artemis program aims to return humans to the moon. Leading up to those missions, projects like Blue Ghost will deliver scientific research to the surface. Blue Origin, SpaceX, and some others are, are working on the human lander solution part of the problem. And there are these precursor missions, smaller science missions to understand that environment better. This program though is really representative of NASA's push to becoming more of a customer rather than being a manufacturer itself. Firefly is not the only one that's won a contract. They've been awarding them steadily in about the 70 to $100 million range. 
We have a couple payloads that are studying the lunar regolith, the lunar soil. We have a couple payloads that are performing science experiments on the way to the moon and then once on the lunar surface. Some that are studying the magnetic field of the moon, some that are studying the magnetic field of the earth. We've got a couple batteries in there on this side. We have one of our payloads here different electronics control boxes that distribute uh, communications and power. We have this retro reflector. I think a lot of the retro reflectors that are on the moon right now are still from the Apollo era to start getting accurate distances to the lunar surface. This is one of the payloads that I think is the coolest. It's called LMS. They have these little probes that are going to shoot out and land on the lunar surface and they have a big mast that's going to go up and measure the magnetic field of the lunar surface. And I think that just sounds so cool. Every kilogram is worth about a million dollars. So weight savings is crucial. So we've done this stuff called generative design where you use a computer algorithm to optimize the structure to survive the loads it needs to survive and nothing else. The company is planning to launch in 2023 using SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Starting next year, it's all about building the flight hardware. And then we basically have a good six months to test it before we eventually fly it. To test how Blue Ghost will perform on the mission, they've recreated the lunar surface for simulations. Our chief engineer always says, we're going to make sure we test like we fly. So that lunar lander sim, we use it for our vision navigation system. You just want to eliminate as many unknowns as possible. While at SpaceX, Markusek witnessed the development of the Dragon capsule program for high revenue resupply missions to the space station and sought similar opportunities for Firefly. The rocket gives you the keys to space. It's critically important, but the big revenue is doing things in space. Blue Ghost fully loaded with payload can generate about $150 million of revenue for the company. Alpha, on the other hand, the launcher, is about $15 million retail per flight. Firefly says it's also competing for rover projects, and the company is developing a space utility vehicle. We're developing a, a vehicle called SUV, Space Utility Vehicle, and it's kind of the do-everything utility vehicle, the Swiss Army knife of spacecraft. Having this spacecraft that can just hang out in orbit and transport things that can service things, that can relay things, is going to be really big for us. Launches are picking up. In 2020, there were a total of 114 orbital launches, 41 of which were commercial. Today, we are in something of an entrepreneurial space age, and we're moving into an era that's going to be basically the SpaceX age when Starship comes online. We're talking about going from $100,000 per kilogram in the shuttle era to $1,000-ish dollars a kilogram with Falcon Heavy to $10 a kilogram with Starship. The broader global space economy is already worth more than $423 billion, and Bank of America forecasts that the space industry as a whole is expected to reach $1.4 trillion by 2030. Space is the, the next frontier for the information revolution. So everything that's been going on in the last few decades with the growth of the internet is now going to be served from space. Why? You can distribute information more efficiently around the Earth from the vantage point of space, having internet from the sky, internet everywhere. Most of the money in terms of the billions and billions of dollars that's been spent in the past decade has mostly centered in either building rockets or building satellites. There's also been steady growth in a couple other subsectors underneath there, such as uh, suborbital space tourism and in space manufacturing and other data services. We're starting to see companies start to go public, those companies start to get acquired. Investor interest in SPACs is high. Both Virgin Orbit and Rocket Lab have taken advantage of this to raise additional capital. I don't want to use uh, going public as, as just another way to fund development, but I think it's a possibility this time next year we could be talking about you know, a public offering of Firefly. The company is up against a lot of competition. Several startups are aggressively fundraising and working to get rockets off the ground. We are tracking a little less than 100 companies that have been started by SpaceX alumni. There are a lot of companies that talk about doing this, but there are very few elite crowd that can actually do it. And within the next few months, when we go out and fly that second rocket, we're going to enter that elite stratosphere of the companies that can actually do this in a repeatable way. But once Firefly and others succeed in reaching space, they will be confronted with another challenge, building and refining operations for regular spaceflight. We want to launch 24 rockets in 2024. One of the things that's going to help us hit that cadence is to fly our next flight as soon as possible and the one after that as soon as possible and start conquering that learning curve as quickly as you can so that you can step into repeatable builds. For them to be a viable business, they're going to need to get into other things. 
The company is reportedly in talks to provide engine technology to competing launch company Astra. The contract specified as many as 50 of the Reaver engines for Astra to use on their own rockets and for future development. We're very open and willing to help other companies that are coming up by um, sharing what, what we've built, but also making a lot of money along the way in the act of sharing. With all of the activity in aerospace, the company says selling components could be a big business. Our vision here is to create an e-commerce marketplace where you can buy all kinds of components, rocket engines, valves, all the building blocks. Customers can buy things as anonymously as you and I can buy things on Amazon. The ideal scenario in 20 years from now, whether it's our rocket or somebody else's rocket, there's probably gonna be Firefly components on that mission. With the inherent risks in the industry, the road ahead will be a tough one. I don't know a single rocket company that is in existence right now that has not had very low lows and very high highs, even into its mature phases. There's no doubt consolidation is coming. <laughs> so there, I don't think there are a room for 100 launcher companies, maybe not even, you know, maybe 10 launcher companies. We see the consolidation coming and, and we want to sort of team up and form uh, new enterprises with players that we think are the most viable for the future. We've already seen that companies that maybe falter or go by the wayside often get acquired. And so that is not necessarily a bad thing. Everyone doesn't need to succeed because it actually can seed growth throughout the rest of the industry. But that isn't deterring those who have a vision where a future in the stars isn't that far off. I don't want this to be another bubble like when we went to the moon originally back in the late 60s, early 70s, where we forgot all that technology. I want to lay the roads now so that generations after generations can use those same roads to get to the moon, get to Mars, go beyond that. I can honestly say this has been a really difficult thing to do, but there's never been a day where just the spark hasn't lit inside me and still just made me feel very blessed and fortunate to be doing this. We're creating great 21st century jobs but I'll also just see people in airports and such that will just come up to me because they see the Firefly logo and they're like, hey, I was with you the whole time I was watching that launch and everything was so exciting. All my friends were watching and everything. And it just clicks in my mind that, you know, what we're doing is not only inspiring to me, but what's more important is it's inspiring to, to thousands of people. I can't get enough of this and I hope I get to keep doing it for a long, long time.